Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of the show, we talk about the fastest way to lose 10 pounds. Later in the show, we talk about how taking a multivitamin can actually improve longevity as well as other topics. In the second half of the show, we coach four live callers on questions such as, why am I not losing fat from cutting after a reverse diet? I'm over 40 and I want to build muscle. What should I do? Can I combine heavy strength training with calisthenics? And I am training for an Ironman. How should I adjust my workouts? Finally, the holidays are upon us and your friends and family will be soon asking you how to lose fat and build muscle. Well, we have the answer for you. It's called Mind Pump Clips. Have them subscribe. You go over and subscribe and enjoy the show. Here is the single easiest and most effective diet hack for most people. Most people actually will lose about 10 pounds just doing the simple thing right here. Avoid heavily processed foods. That's it. Did you see our good buddy on Andrew Huberman talking about that? Lane? Yes. Was he? Have you guys listened to that episode yet? I got to listen to it I all haven't. the way through. I just saw a clip that was shared and... Uh, Huberman brought up to him about processed foods, which mm. of course you know. He's been changing his tune. He a bit. he sounded very mind pump esque the way he answered it. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was I thought it was pretty good, you know. So you know, Lane is always well. Um, to his credit, Lane Lane is all he'll he's always he's trying to grow by and, what the research says. Yeah, and he's yeah. always he's always trying to stay ahead and. And so his message is going to change as the research starts to change. I thought he answered it. I thought he answered it really well. So maybe maybe Andrew can find the clip and then share it for the audience because I don't want to uh, butcher it the way he said it. But trying to focus on minimally processed foods is very important. The one caveat I would say is I think it's important to understand why, because otherwise people can make this weird association that, like, if I eat any minimally or any processed food, it's going to kill me, or like every time I eat it. It's like I'm smoking a cigarette and my health, you know, my longevity is declining. I think the way he articulated his point was he was just like, yes, he agreed that for the most part, people should probably try and avoid that. He goes, but I I, I caution you on how you how you read into that because then me, many people will take that to the extreme of that, like now all of a sudden we demonize right. that and there's, you know. There's yes, so a study just came out that just connected the consumption of heavily processed foods with a... a pretty substantial increase in all-cause mortality. So this is a big study. And you're right, Adam. What, <clears throat> what some people are going to do, or I guess what the popular media is going to do, is they're going to say, oh, heavily processed foods are just deadly and unhealthy. Yeah. It, that's not necessarily the case. Now, yes, it's true that generally, generally speaking, ultra-processed foods are not as healthy as whole natural foods. But the reason why eating them increases all-cause mortality mainly is uh, due to the fact that you just overeat. Yeah. yeah. Bottom line. The bottom line is, I mean, look, here's the deal. I could tell everybody watching this right now who wants to lose weight, cut your calories by five to 600 calories a day and you'll lose weight. I could. Or I could just say, avoid these foods and you'll get the same result. Mm -hmm. Except you don't feel like you're restricting. You're not going to feel like you're starving and hungry. Um, and you'll feel like you're satisfied. And it's simply avoiding these foods that make you overeat. That's really what it's all about. Yeah, it's just the excess of calories that that it leads to because, uh, you know, it promotes that. Like the the cravings start to increase. And, and so it's really just it always amounts to like just uh, it tips you into a bit of excess calories, which then leads to other like health problems. I mean, I think that the the most important thing is just the awareness around it is that you're aware that they're engineered that way in order to to make you want to eat more therefore when you get put yourself in a situation where they're you know you have easy access to them be aware of how where how what that can lead to and i think that just the awareness around that, that it's that, because I, I think a lot of people don't even think about that. I think they just think like, oh, this tastes really good, or it's labeled a healthy product, or, and so they just, yes. you know, yeah. they eat and they they mindlessly eat, because we do a lot of this stuff like that, distracted, and they don't realize how easily they can overeat by not being aware of what this, how this food was engineered. So the, yes. the awareness around it to me mm -hmm. is the most important part Look, of the conversation. It's like this, it's like saying, hey, I'm going to make good decisions uh, in life, but I'm going to do that while being drunk all the time. Yeah, like you can <laughs> technically make good decisions while you're inebriated, but oh, it's going to be really hard because a lot you're going to be you're going to want to make a lot of <laughs> stupid decisions. Well, when you eat these foods, your your the the tendency to overeat is so strong and so hard. Like good luck. Like you can sit there and white knuckle it this entire time. See, there's this huge myth. This is a big one. There's this huge myth that humans are eating machines. That if you put food in front of us we're going to overeat. And, and, the, and the myth goes like this. 
humans evolved where food was scarce. So we evolved to be these eating machines and eat as much as possible. That's not entirely true. Our bodies actually naturally will regulate themselves to where you're not going to become obese if you eat whole natural foods for the most part. It's actually quite difficult to overeat the way that most people overeat when the foods that you eat are whole and natural. You just naturally feel more satisfied. You hit palate fatigue. And yeah, you're not going to get shredded, but you're not going to be 70 pounds overweight as well. So it's a, it's a huge myth that our tendency is to be obese. That's not true. The, the truth is our tendency, our nature is to be at this kind of balanced body weight, to not under eat and to not overeat. But what we've done is we've designed yeah. foods to, and really spent a lot of time, money and energy in designing foods that make you overeat to the tune of 600 more calories a day. This is what studies show consistently. That's a big deal. That's a 600 calories is when I put someone on a diet or when I put them on a bulk, that's the limit of how much calories I raise or drop. And that's naturally what happens when you consume. Yeah, this no, thing. we have these natural limiters. It's just like we, we distract ourselves. And so we're able to kind of like push through and, and gain more of an excess of calories because, you know, either it's novelty. And so we're like kind of hijacking that with, uh, you know, the different flavors and, and stimulus there. Um, and it, it's just one of those things like, yeah. well, you know, I think, um, one of the things I think Lane does a really good job is he does a good job of dismantling the, the wellness uh, community that really tries to argue against processed foods and they use the, they use the chemical argument. these are yeah. full of chemicals and showing how cancerous these chemical and like right. they try and use the, the this to scare you from these processed foods and how dangerous and how bad they could be i just think that's mm. the wrong way to approach that argument I agree. it's like I, I eat processed foods in my diet all the time it's not something it's not what i'm trying to do it's the goal is to eat whole foods but there are points where i use this example with my sister-in-law's helping her the other day if you're driving in a car and you haven't eaten for four hours and you're you're starting to get cravings and you're hungry and you have access to a protein bar in there or you could pull over to gas station get fire cheetos yeah. get the have the fucking protein bar i would right. rather you i'd rather you which make is still the, processed right right it's, it's a, that's what i'm saying it's a processed choice still i know it's not realistic she's not going to pull over and go buy a chicken and then go get a grill and then grill it up on the side yeah. of the freeway and like <laughs> i know that's not going to happen so realistically I, I would I would prefer that she makes that choice over this other one. So I and but just and then I would educate her on let just be mindful though how how much you'll like that and then you'll want another one and another one and because it's considered a healthy food we can get into this uh, these habits of consuming more and more. So the chemicals that are in heavily processed foods are they healthy? Eh, not necessarily. Are they like these super dangerous things that are going to give you? cancer and kill you right away? No, probably not. Most of the the danger and the negative health effects come from the fact that many of these chemicals in these foods are in there to ramp up its palatability. That's why a lot of those chemicals are in there. They're in there to keep the shelf life high. They're in there to maintain mouthfeel, crunchiness, uh, the smell, the texture, the comp, the, the, the way that the, the taste hits your mouth before, during, and after, you know, you're eating the food, the way it feels in your hands. M majority of the chemicals that are in there are in that or for shelf life. So are, are they b dangerous on their own? No. But when you combine them in, it's like, literally, it's like a formula. When they combine them in the right, perfect amount, you create a food that is irresistible, that has drug-like properties. And you can and mindlessly eat it. Yes. It, which is really the point I was trying to get to. Uh, was just the fact that like we we can eat uh, and be distracted. We can eat with speed, um, and you know a lot of these things that we can override, uh, so we don't have to pay attention to your body's natural signals of saying, "Okay, we're satisfied." Yeah, in fact, th they do show that when people eat, when you eat heavily processed foods, not only do you eat on average six hundred more calories a day, you also eat the food much faster. There's, there's yeah. like, again, it's like a drug-like behavior and they've done a really damn good job of, or of designing these foods. So, so it's, so here's the point I'm trying to make with this. You can count calories. You can restrict yourself. You can do that. Right. Or you can say, I'm just not going to eat these foods and then eat until I'm satisfied. And the results will be the same. The results will largely be the same. You'll eat a more appropriate level of calories. It took me a long time to figure this out with clients, but when I did, this was the single most effective thing that I could that I ever possibly did with diet. Where literally I'll tell a client, I used to love doing this. I'd get a client and I'd say, I don't want you to 
we're not going to restrict your food. We're not going to, here's what I want you to do. Eat until you're satisfied. Just avoid foods that come in wrappers, boxes that have long ingredient lists. In other words, avoid ultra processed foods and just eat as much as you want normally and eat until you're satisfied. And they'd lose 10 pounds. And they'd always come to me and be like, oh my God, the crazy chemicals they put in these processed foods make you gain body fat. I said, well, not, not really like that. I said, you know that you over, you eat more when you eat those foods. No, I'm, I'm eating until I'm full. That's exactly. Your full meter, it's like having a thermostat in your house that's set at 71 degrees, okay? Your heater is not going to surpass 71 degrees. What, what ultra-processed foods do is they take the thermostat level and they move it up to 80. So now the thermostat keeps running until you get up to 80. That's your hunger. That's your appetite. The thermostat on your appetite has been shifted when you consume these foods to where the only way to prevent yourself from overeating is to literally count your calories and restrict yourself. Otherwise, you're going to overeat. And this is why it's the easiest, most simple, and most effective you know, diet. Hack. Did you guys see that uh, that meme, the the thermostat one for the dad for Christmas presents? <laughs> no, it is. Yes. Oh my god, it's so good. It's a it's like a picture of like an old school thermostat with a dial that you turn, and it's like uh, to the left, less Christmas presents. Oh, to the right, yeah. more yeah. Christmas yeah. presents. Yeah, more Christmas <laughs> presents. <laughs> that was so clever. What is it? What is it about dads and thermostats? It's so true. It is. Thermostats? It's a control thing, dude. Is it a control it's thing or is it a be. temperature thing? Well, I mean, that's control, like in the fact that like I. I know I'm going to not get as good as sleep if it's somebody messes with that. And so that immediately triggers me. I'm like, yeah. don't mess with that. And remote control. TV remote control is the other one. Yeah. Like who holds a remote control when you guys watch TV at home? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys do. Yeah. yeah. Almost the same here. It's the guy. Did, did your dads do this? My dad used to do this where he, you know, of course he was the dad. So he'd, he'd have the remote and we'd watch TV and he'd doze off, you know, while we're watching something. And it's something we don't want to watch. So I'd go and like, take the remote control from his hand. He'd wake up all pissed off. Or if I changed, at one point I bought another remote control. Yeah. So when he falls asleep, I could change. Oh, yeah. How does he know? He's asleep. I'd change the channel. He'd wake up, put it's it like back. It's like a sixth sense. I'm like, yeah. dad, you're sleeping. Why are we? Why do you care if I change the channel? Uh, we used to get these big things about him. Oh, yeah. Ethan tried to try pull that on me. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Cyber Monday. It's an extension of Black Friday. 60% off every single MAPS workout program, including bundles. 60% off everything. And you can use this code multiple times. There's no limit. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Use the code cyber Monday for the discount. Now I'm going to give away to celebrate uh, a super bundle. This is a huge bundle of workout programs. So one of you can win, but you have to do this to enter. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, do all those things. If we like your comment and declare you the winner, we will do so in the comment section and then you win free access to the MAPS Super Bundle. All right, here comes the show. Hey, uh, so Adam, I got something funny to tell you. Okay, tell me. Do you, so this is, this. I think this is labeled as the greatest, like, loss of wealth. Oh, the fastest yeah. loss of yeah, wealth. Yeah, yeah, Do you see the FTX guy filed bankruptcy? Is that? Okay. That's the crypto guy? Yeah, the guy that was worth, like, billions and billions of dollars. FTX CEO yep, yep. and name brand crypto billionaire yeah. Sam Bankman freed. Yep. yep. Okay. He lost 94% of his net worth in one day. Yes. Uh, why does that make my stomach hurt? <laughs> well, listen. <laughs> his, his net worth went from oh. $15.6 billion in one day to one. Oh my, billion dollars. Oh my God. 15.6 to one. I mean, you saw the, wow. the, the that's big, crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, uh, um, Zuckerberg lost like 70 billion in a day or two. That's crazy. I, I, I don't know where we're at total right now. And of course it, it, it fluctuates as the market goes up and down because yeah. so many of these guys are tied up so much of their net worth is tied up in these companies. Right. And so obviously as the, the share the market goes up, yeah, the market goes down, whatever. Um, but I do think that we, uh, we have seen in this, the last year, the, the craziest loss as far like trillions of dollars, have fallen out of the market from the, the stock the stock market and taken such a big hit. And so many people tied up into not only like shares, but then also the the crypto bubble that we've yeah. seen. Like, well, then you say Tom Brady and Giselle were like, Dude, did you see that? Did I show FTX you that? Guy. 640 million, right? Yeah. But they were tied up into, was it FTX? Yeah, yeah. FTX. And so was Steph Curry. Both those guys are, uh, those guys were investors in like the early rounds. They were, they carried a lot of that. You one. know, when you're playing with that kind of money, Thanks. I th and you were investing that kind of money, you have to, you know, cause I have a lot of family that's in, in, in financial advisors and they say one of the most important things to consider is somebody's temperament, how they are. Are they, are they conservative? Are they risky? 
Um, what, you know, are, are they okay with losing money, but, but also taking the risk they can make a lot of money? Like you have to consider that because mm-hmm. when you're dealing with that much money, you have to be okay with the fact that you might lose it when you take those chances. Otherwise, right. yeah. like remember in 2008, yeah, it's not secure. There were bankers and uh, investment advisors committing suicide because they, they they had lost so much money that they couldn't deal with that, and they ended mm-hmm. up killing themselves. So you gotta you gotta you gotta know that when you're when you're playing with that much money, you gotta be okay with. Well, if I lose it all, you know, how am I gonna be? Am I gonna be okay with that? Now, wasn't there comparisons to the dot com bubble with this this what's happening and shifting with crypto right now? One of you guys was talking about that before. Yeah, I mean, it's very it's very similar to what we've seen. I mean, what we saw during the dot com, just like I think that uh, you know, cryptocurrency and NFTs, I believe, are here to stay and are are going to be the future. Just like you would have said back in 2001 or whatever it was that the dot-com era is going to change how we do business forever, as right. it did. The problem but there was, was only a few major yeah, there companies was, that came through. Exactly. And and then and then the likely I forgot I've seen statistics on the likelihood that you would have picked one of those, you know, four or five companies that ended up like the Amazons that that took off. The likelihood of that is like as likely of you like hitting the lotto. It's like mm-hmm. the same thing going on in the NFT and the crypto okay, space is that this idea. And so many people think that, you know, Bitcoin is so stable because it's like the big one, the first one. So and I just, I so disagree now with that. I just think that we just don't know. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. We, it's still we, a huge risk. We, 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 we don't know that. And I just, when you're messing with the money, I just, and we see how fucked up and corrupt our government is to think that they're not going to get in and, and mess with it, mess with that or, or take, take it over to benefit them. So I'm, I'm so skeptical of how it plays out, and and I know that if if you've listened to, I like your play. I like the way what you said about crypto, which is have some because there's always going to be a black market. <laughs> so yeah, that makes sense. No, I, if there's I, a black market, then that I was actually the, that's exactly what I was going to comment on because I know if someone's heard sound bites of me talking about crypto, I was probably the most bullish about it with you guys early on. But what I was bullish about was that I do believe it'll never go away because. Our black market is massive, yeah. and there will always. And I, I know how many people use it on the black market right now, and it's completely changed the game. It was very difficult to move money. In, that one of the hardest things in the in the black market world, particular drugs and stuff like that, is actually the cash is the and money is. part. Yep, it's not actually the drugs. We actually move drugs back and forth all over the place. It's what do you do with all easy. this cash? It's the cash. It's the cash and being able to and and even just yeah. something as crazy as carrying that kind of cash. Like a million dollars in, in cash is a, is a lot of money. You can just stick that in your pocket. You know what I'm saying? It's not like the movies where it's like a million dollars and it's a briefcase. Yeah. And they open it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dude, so, yeah, it's so funny. So. Adam, Adam has this amazing ability. I got to tell the audience. <laughs> Adam has this like Rain oh, Man-like yeah. ability yes. to look at From a stack, stack. Yeah. of money and tell you accurately how much is the money is yeah. like oh that's seven thousand like a brick that's like, fifty thousand yeah, dollars ten thousand dollars that's or to the like almost Whoa. to the you're you you're within fifty bucks it's pretty good he'll yeah. look at money and be like that's sixteen thousand four hundred and seventy five dollars I'm like huh and then we'll yeah. count it I'm like huh he just kind of like weighs it and you, that, know. you know that's and uh, that's because you dealt with the yeah, med- the cash. marijuana industry, yeah a right? lot of cash you know a lot of cash you count so how much does a million dollars actually take up. Like, or I don't know well, if you've ever seen that. Much, I mean, but. yeah, no, I have. And it, it really is, uh, if it's in hundreds or it's in twenties, it makes a huge difference. And if it, how the, the bills are. And so a lot of times in these movies, when you see it, like the, the dom- denomination, what, where I call bullshit on the right is when they say the amount. And then I see that what the denomination they're using, I'm like that. And sometimes it's both ways. Sometimes you see them massively exaggerated. Like it's a lot of money. It's like, well, that would be like a stack like this big, you know, what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like here's a, here's a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and they're just and swimming it's, in it's, on the yeah, bed. It's like you massive. Know? And then and you see it's hundreds and you're like, no, that's not true. It would not be anywhere near that, <laughs> you know, like that. That'd be like a bunch of ones, you know what I'm saying? If someone handed you. So, so yeah, they just exaggerated all the time. You even see that with, um, game shows where they give someone like $10,000 they give someone like ten thousand dollars, and they give them like this crazy stack like this. Ones. Yeah, it's like you know, a ten thousand dollar stack is you know only like this big in hundreds. Yeah, so go to the strip club just to make yeah. it look you know super crazy. But my, one of my favorite scenes in a movie is the part with uh, Matthew McConaughey and Lincoln Lawyer. Do you remember that that scene? No, I don't watch that. So in, you ever seen that movie? I've seen that movie. Oh, it's a I'm great. That's a great movie. So it's the very beginning. It opens the opening scene where uh, he's in his limo and he's in the back. And these, like, all these, uh, it's like Harley gang. They're, like, pulling around. They pull around the limo. They make the limo pull over. And you think, like, some shit's going to go down crazy. And it's actually somebody somebody from him that's hired him. And he's paying him off in an envelope. And he grabs the envelope and he 
He go any why is this? And he tells him how how light it is by how many hundred dollars about that. And then he t- explains to him why it's off like that. But he doesn't even count it. He just like shakes the money and he goes, knows exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> yeah. I would have thought that was bullshit until I met you because uh-huh. you've done it so many times now. I'm like, how does he know? I'm not a hundred percent, but I definitely I'm pretty. I could get I could definitely call bullshit when it's like way off. You know, to me, it's so because I've done it enough times that. When a when a movie or a show, and Katrina thinks it's annoying because I do it so much. When we'll be watching, I'm like, that's not one hundred twenty thousand dollars. It's not even that's so, <laughs> so off. Like it's just, no, it's, what is this stupid? This movie's fake, yeah. dude. That's like any time they're doing a medical procedure and Courtney has to like interject. You know, like they would never put a bolus there. Yeah. What? Like what? <laughs> like, what? I, I, I don't care. Right. <laughs> I, okay. So that okay. Don't you guys though like appreciate movies that that take that extra step to make because that's such a simple thing to make accurate. It's like okay, anybody who's ever counted this much money or anybody that's actually been in an ER knows that that's well, not how it would go down. It's like how what, what was, makes me are laugh? You being lazy. You didn't what, just ask somebody. Well, so this right. is what makes yeah, me laugh. Consult anybody. Yeah. yeah. So what makes me laugh is that you'll do this in a movie that the whole movie is fake as fuck to begin with. Like there's aliens <laughs> fighting like <laughs> yeah. plant yeah, and, people. And something simple that you and can make like, real. And you're like, that gun wouldn't shoot that way. You're like, what? <laughs> the whole movie is like, this is a, it's a cartoon or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, but what a- I feel is like, but that's exactly the point though. It's like, you have all this crazy over the top fake stuff, but then the, the, the most basic thing that you can make yeah. real and you simple, get wrong. you get wrong yeah. or you lie on. It's just like, ah, oh. then it makes, of course, the unbelievable stuff even more unbelievable. Yeah. It's like, you can't even do the real shit, right? <laughs> of course, yeah. I'm not going to believe that. We stuff. had a cousin that was a police yeah. officer and we'd watch action movies with him and he'd sit there and count how many times they'd shoot a gun without reloading. He's like, wow, where do you <laughs> that, get it? I bet that drove Where do you get it? Where do you get a handgun with 30 rounds? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just ruin the movie. <laughs> well, oh, come on, man. Or, you know, we watched it's with like them. a video game. Dude. We Just watched, going. we watched the fakest movie of all time with him. Commando. You ever watched, you've, you've seen Commando. I love right? Commando. Come when on. Commando, he yeah. showed Arnold Schwarzenegger shows up to this cartel and there's literally mm-hmm. an army of people with, with rifles and machine guns. Well, and he just, he kills everybody. He well, just kills everybody. Yeah. They can't touch him. What was that one quote? Like, he kept hanging around or something where he like fell off the cliff. Oh, oh. Well, that's, uh, from another, that's another one. That's not Commando. I thought is that it? was Commando. No? Is that Commando where he says that? No. My favorite, my favorite. He uh, always has his one liner. My favorite so line was in Commando. They obviously kidnap his daughter and they, he's got to do this job for them. Whatever. He's on the plane with the handler. Yeah. And so he's on the plane and they haven't taken off yet. So then he like reaches forward to tie a shoe and he elbows the guy in the head. The guy passes out and he puts the the jacket over the guy's head and then the the, the, the flight attendant comes by. <laughs> Please don't bother my friend. He's dead tired. Like he, dead, just, dead he kills tired. him with an elbow on the player. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> he uh, just covers him up. Dude, <laughs> speaking good. of uh, uh, movies and whatnot, like uh, Sophia Stewart. Okay, so Jerry actually sent me this DM of a, a video of. So this lady oh, is that the one I sent had you? Claimed, yeah, yeah. Because like, I'm so I, glad you brought that up. I went, I went through this before I went down this rabbit hole because I heard a long time ago that. The creators of the Matrix. Um, the is it true? Tell me, is it true? Before Hold you- on a second. Well, okay. I saw this. Okay, so so she actually sued them because, according to her, she had written this book that um, basically outlined the entire um, trilogy of of the Matrix and also uh, the Terminator. So basically, like her, she was she was uh, claiming that that in. in and basically, I think she sued James Cameron as well because of the Terminator. But basically, like like John Connor and all that was was the prequel to Neo and everything yeah, in so the she, Matrix. She said that the Terminator happened first and that Neo was the son yes. of uh, Connor. And it's all biblical, right? So it's like this whole like- So the machines- and Prophetic. Up, ended um, up turning into the Matrix. You know what though? They did do a. Did you watch the Animatrix? These are like the, oh, the yeah. cartoons that show kind of what happened before. Right. And- so there's there's some holes to the whole thing. So as is well. it okay? Like, wait, so back me up because I just saw the same thing too. Jerry sent it to me. I sent it over to you guys to, to figured you guys would be able to fact check it better than me because I don't get into this stuff as much. I don't know yeah. if she. I didn't look into if she actually wrote the like, book. Like yeah, she did. Yeah. She- so she did. Okay. So I looked into that and um, it, she didn't actually publish the book till like 2006. And which book had claimed the Terminator? So it's, it's called um oh so it wasn't the, the Terminator. third eye i think it's um she's saying that they all ripped the, off of her yeah the third eye yeah so they're saying she's saying that like she entered this contest um to basically write for a comic book and and said that that uh, the 
um, Wachowski brothers, I think is their name, yeah. that they stole all of her content um, and then made a movie. Are the Wachowski brothers who wrote Terminator? No. No. Matrix. That's, Matrix. Yeah. So, so who wrote James Terminator? Cameron, James Cameron was responsible for that. Was he for the first uh, He, he claimed that, he, so James Cameron claimed that he thought of it in because he had a nightmare about like some robot coming to kill him. And so that was like the inspiration. Did James Cameron do the original Terminator? Yeah. He did the first one? Yeah. Oh, I thought he just did uh, Terminator 2. No, that was his whole franchise. I think, too, he didn't make much money off of it initially because of the deal that he worked out. Oh, really? So there's this whole thing with that. Like, um, But yeah, it was interesting. I didn't know Terminator was part because I heard about the Matrix uh, that this lady had claimed that these brothers stole her her idea. In a sense, I'm surprised you didn't go read that book. Now I'd be. I want to. Yeah, yeah. I say it sounds interesting to see. Like, if you were to read it, if it lines up really well, like, bro, yeah. this is way too close. So that she took him to court. She didn't win. Like that's the other thing. So it's like her claims are just claims, uh, unsubstantiated claims. Wow. So it's like you kind of have to. But you got to kind of wonder. Okay, someone wonder, like James yeah. Cameron, who's got a lot of power, a lot of money, probably a lot of connections, and this small novel writer. You know yeah. what though? You know, kind of this makes, happens a lot. You know, though, dude, it does. But you know what annoys me about this? Yeah, is. I, I get it. You had a great idea, or you had an idea, I should say. Yes, I'm. I, that doesn't mean doesn't mean a it's lot. worth anything yet. It doesn't mean any, a lot. Like this, James Cameron turned it into a like what goes into making thank it. Thank you. This crazy profitable franchise. Part of it's your idea, but but that's a small the part idea of is it. the smallest part. Well, I mean, and I you, tried you, to you, to explain this to my friend who always gets in a debate with me about that because like he hasn't actually executed. And put like okay. the idea all the way through it's like together. This. It's, it's like it's like this, dude. It's such a bigger thing. It's than you like think. imagine if in 1990 I wrote a paper and I said, "Man, you imagine if we had a cell phone that you could touch the screen and do yeah. this." And then they make the I iPhone. Came I'm like, up That's with my that idea. idea. Like, yeah. Okay, good, great. Well, not to mention, <laughs> it's so <laughs> lazy. Everything is yeah. built on other people's ideas. Everything. Yeah. Every, your 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 phones, all electronics, the clothes you wear, yeah. the. The, the mics we're talking on is somebody else had an idea like it before that person either did it or improved upon it yeah. and then made it. And then somebody else goes and improve. I mean, it's like the idea that everyone is this a complete original <laughs> thought is hilarious. She got it from the Bible. So somebody exactly. say, so she got it from like biblical stories. You know what this reminds so, me of? Yeah. Do you guys remember years ago? I'm not going to call anybody out, but so I'll keep it vague. But we had an idea years ago when we started mind pump that we would have this, network where we would have other podcasts under us. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 that was definitely an, all right. Hold on a second. <laughs> we communicated this idea yeah, yeah. to this other yeah. fitness podcast at the time, which was big uh, at the time. Now they're, <laughs> now they're not really, they're look not anywhere, you, you. but they, <laughs> they took this idea from us and implemented it. Good. And we never implemented it because we couldn't work out the logistics and there were lots of issues. Well, anyway, they implemented our idea and it tanked. We were, so, <laughs> we're like, oh, like thanks, thanks, for thanks for trying that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we know for, for sure it was a bad idea. Yes. I'm glad we didn't thanks do for that. being the guinea pig. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't do that idea. Yeah. Anyway, oh, not going to say who it was. But uh, yeah. Let's just, yeah. let's just say we'll that. Just, they, we'll just put that out there. Tonight. I bet if you're an OG, if you listen long enough, you could piece that together. Uh, uh, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> hey, so you want to hear some weird, uh, weird statistic? Yeah. So this is crazy. I just read this. Do you know? Okay. So the average five year old laughs a hundred times in a day. An average five year old? Yeah. Like kid will laugh like a hundred times in a day. Okay. Okay. Do you know how many times the average 40 year old laughs in a day? Once 50, or twice. 50. Four. Oh, yeah. I was going to say four it's times. Yeah. Four times a day. God, we just lose miserable, miserable fucks. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. I laugh four times an hour. I well, laugh you, all the time. You see that chart that I was sharing with you? I think Dr. Molly was the one who shared that. I said I showed you guys where that shows as you as you get older the how lonely you get. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. that sucks. Yeah that's, yeah. that's like it was like dramatically different between the ages of like teenage years to like your later 50, 60, how 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 far off you that are. That really sucks because historically old cultures, one of the challenges with new cultures and America is a very new culture in comparison uh, to the rest. And we have some great things in our culture, but there's some stuff that we discarded. And one of those things is the, is how uh, we, how we view and treat uh, older people uh, in, in, in new modern societies, older people, like they're old, they're not cool. They're not yeah. sexy. Yeah. We just discard old cultures, older people yeah, revered. Uh, people who are in older age because they have lots of wisdom. And I think there's a lot of value in that. And you're seeing the the, the consequences of 
of not doing that. Like, you know what's number interesting? One, we're not wise. And number two, these old people are lonely. Oh. We don't treat them very well. It's terrible. You know what's interesting, Sal, is you know, why you're talking about that and, and bringing up the whole four. I'm looking at the chart right now that I was just referring to. And it's comparing like uh, you know, your partner, your coworkers, your children, your family, friends, basically your interaction with people. Yeah. And all the lines are kind of close. Right around 40 is when it like makes a clear like yeah. split. So around 40 you lose a lot of touch with a lot of those people and become more and more lonely. Ironically, the same time that you just referred to the 40 year old laughing only four times yeah, a day in comparison. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting that it happens around that age, right? Our age right now. So we're about to get miserable. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Hey, you know, this Doug, are you miserable? I'm not going to let it happen. What do you think? Take huh? a look at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Smiles. <Yes. laughs> he's laughing all the way to the bank. guys. Yeah. He's, ha wow. he's happy. He's happy all the time. <laughs> I mean, anyway. All right, another cool statistic. This one's kind of crazy. I did not realize that this was a thing. There was a study done in, uh, there was a, a, a th over a thousand British and American people were surveyed. Okay, so a thousand people were surveyed. This is wild. I didn't know this. One out of every 30 people, so it's not a lot, but it's still people, poo in the shower. Poop in the shower? One out of 30 people admit that they have pooed. Poop? Pooed. Feces, caca, dude. How in the shower? Ugh. I mean, I pee in the shower. Like, that's completely everybody acceptable. pees in the shower. You have Not to like everybody. <laughs> There's actually a stat on that. That's actually it's like one in four or something. Really? Yeah, yeah. I've actually peeing seen in the shower is fine, dude. Pooing in the okay, sh in so your he, shower, by the way. I don't pee in everybody else's shower. Let's talk logistics. I don't take a shower in your house. I mean, you got you got to like waffle stomp that down, and it's, like, it's a Bro, whole process. Why like, would come you? On. What are you doing? How lazy are you? Are you just in there like? Uh, I get mad at Katrina for getting her hair stuck in the drain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I walked in, she was taking a shit in the shower. I'd fucking flip my lid, bro. Oh my god! Wow. Well, you probably called yeah, she's, like, she's like, "Well, there's no hair in there, though." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wow. Well, okay. Now this makes sense having managed big gyms. Well, because it, I thought that was kind of a cultural thing. One set. No, I don't know. But if these are American and, and, and English people, so yeah. I, mean, I guess I look. You manage gyms. Yeah, Once or twice that. a year, you'll find a poo in the shower. Well, I you just, know the other this thing makes that, sense now. You know, I know Doug loves when we talk about poop. Um, the other, the other thing that you saw in the just remember, like some cultures that stand up to poop, like over holes and stuff like that. They yeah. would actually stand on the toilet. Yeah, and they you know, would right. shit. you see, see their shoe prints. Yeah. on the toilet, and, then, and you come in, and you see like shit all over the place. You're like, I don't understand how there's <laughs> shit on the back of the wall. Like, what is going on? It's so that's, baffling. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah that's they, different. That's a bad tummy though. Capital McKee, man, I used to see that all the time. I know. That, there's but, just yeah. some of those bad behaviors like that. The, it, I'll see like um, sometimes too. Like culturally, some people will just throw trash like outside their car. Oh, that's just, I'm like, what? Yeah, that's like, asshole. who does this? Yeah, Says the guy that mixes recycling with trash. <laughs> yeah. At least he puts it in the garbage. Touche. <laughs> At least he puts it in the garbage. All right. I got another cool statistic. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I had, perfect. I had some pretty, I, I found some pretty cool statistics. Here's another cool one. Did you know that one man makes enough sperm in two weeks that he could theoretically impregnate every woman on earth? Whoa! In two weeks, really? That's Game on, dudes! Made. No, no, you still got it. You still got it. There's still some logistics there, bro. Well, dude, I mean, that's a lot of sperm. Yeah, well, that is a lot. And along those lines, look at Genghis Khan, dude. Lines, let's hear this. Along those that guy lines, a commercial productive. transition, please. No, it's not. Oh. A lot. You know why we're so hyper, by the way, yeah. everybody? Yeah, you know we why are. we're so hyper? You want to yeah. do a commercial? This is true. Yeah, we all drank. Organify peak power. Yeah. That, what do you guys think? I, I was so hyped, I was like forgetting. Things. What do you guys think My about? Mind's going I, like fast. I like it a lot. It's it's great. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. It feels really good. It's, it's tastes smooth. good. It's I, got like a nice little lemony I taste. Told you guys, yeah. this is the best. People are gonna take this and they're gonna be like, "This is the okay, best so pre-workout for, for the audience." No, because I'm I, hyped. I really liked Pure a lot too. So tell me. So this has caffeine. Pure does not. Yes. What else is different between their pure blend versus what you have in peak power? Well, you, it's, you know? got, uh, it's got it's uh, got coffee factor. Uh, what's it called? Um, Neurofactor, which is really good for BDNF in the brain, brain derived neurotropic factor. So, literally, it's like miracle go grow for the brain. Then it has lion's mane, but the, that they make sure to put the fruiting body in there. A lot of people don't realize this, but when you look at a mushroom, the cap, the fruiting body. This is where you get a majority of the of the good stuff. And companies that sell you mushrooms often will mix the whole thing like in there. Just the, like grind up the stem with it? Yeah, or they don't grow it on good stuff. Like mm. mushrooms are like sponges. And whatever they grow on, they end up absorbing. All right. They, they grow, they, this is legit lion's mane good stuff. But anyway, it's a, it's a combination of compounds that give you this really nice euphoric 
high. It feels really great. So. I re I really hope that this product does really well. Um, so Organifi lets you to do this more often. It'd be kind of cool for us to have some control and say and supplements. You're just trying to placate me, Adam. I think that's no, <laughs> to give you what you, you want, to give you what you want without us ever having to pivot into that yeah. direction because I have no desire for us to do There's that. There's got to so, be other you know people listening that are, are experimental like you and just want to like you I'll know, put you us yes, all together. This way you can wet your beak without. I'll us tell you something right that. now. If I ever you made need to help sound is pursuit. If we ever made a supplement and you guys give me full control and we didn't work with any other supplement companies. I would push the I would push the legal limits. That's what I would do. To, <laughs> I would make a supplement that would be wild. So and I wouldn't, party, it wouldn't dudes. necessarily be a health supplement. It would be like here, try this. <laughs> yeah, here, try here's this. Here's what's here's what's happening. Go for a ride. But this peak powers is is, is uh, definitely a more. Okay, back to all right. Back to back to commercial. Back to interesting statistics. Did you know that the uh, your your objective attractiveness as a man is connected to your testicle size? Did you know this? <laughs> I think I did hear this once before. So the better looking you are, the bigger your balls are. The no, smaller. Small. The smaller your balls are. We're not talking about the 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 you know the penis. We're talking about the balls. The better looking you are, the smaller your testicles are. Okay, so how do they? Okay, how do they? Do they? How do they measure this? Well, yeah, like, I know how they measure the <laughs> balls, but how they measure the attractiveness? So do they take like a bunch of guys and then like girls all score them on a one to ten on how attractive yes, he was? Yes, but there's also and then all the guys. There's also scored. facial symmetry really? and stuff that they use that'll that'll. And know, so this guy's they, got some BBs. He's doing well. Yeah. yeah. So and now this is true with animals, right? This is very true with monkeys. And the theory is that the less attractive you are, the more successful you have to be with having less sex. Right. Because you, so you, you, you ain't need more done. opportunity. Like, so you got to be ready to go. Yeah. So if you're good looking, you have a lot of opportunities. Your body doesn't need to make tons and tons of sperm. So you get lots of opportunity. Yes. But like, if you're, if you're like, fuck, if you're ugly. Now does, does, they're does, like, we got one does shot. Ball, does ball <laughs> yeah. size have a direct relation to sperm count? I believe so. Oh, interesting. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, I believe so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Vol volume. That's, so, that's so funny. next time your buddy was like, I got the biggest balls. I'm like, you sure do, yeah, buddy. Wow. I've never yeah, seen him, but I can see your face. Yes. And I bet you're right. <laughs> about that right there, dude. <laughs> anyway, so uh, study came Cold out. Cold water's my friend. Study came out that connected multivitamin use to better longevity. And here's what I like about the study. They actually controlled for the healthy user bias. Okay, I was just going to say, because that's what we've talked about before. Yeah, because like, people yeah. who take multivitamins tend to work out, tend to eat better and all that stuff. They actually tried to control for the healthy user bias, and they found that people who take a multivitamin once they control for all that stuff, uh, they tend to have better longevity. And they think it's probably due to lower rates of nutrient deficiencies, obviously, because the multivitamin helps cover that really? stuff. Really? And it's not, yes. Yeah, because, I mean, immediately I would assume it's because of the care. And they, you know, that's one thing that they care about and everything else yeah. is sort of, uh, you know, compiles after that. Yeah, no, know, so so there's probably value in taking a multivitamin. Do you know, are yeah. we getting better or worse? Meaning, as as a as a whole, Depends. like, are are is the society getting better at hitting more of their nutrients, or are we getting worse at it with all these foods that are fortified with nutrients, with all the supplementation? Historically and, better, hmm. historically better. Okay, like, but over the last thirty years, worse. When I say historically, like you compare us now to a hundred years, two hundred years ago, like way better. Like we're not kids aren't you know people aren't getting rickets and, but yeah. thirty years, twenty years, we're seeing more nutrient deficiencies, mainly because people eat less uh whole foods people yeah. and the and the whole foods that we do eat are less nutrient dense vegetables fruits I feel like well, that's what I was, there's alarmists out there that are kind of yeah. saying that from the soil like yep. we're not really like yep. getting uh the actual density that we should be from yep. uh these that these in the plants. sun too don't you believe that there's there's so much yes. i feel like about the sun vitamin d is one of the number one nutrient well, they have that and it's we know that already i just yeah. feel like that there's there's more to that than just what we realize already yeah. too that there's got to be more value to getting out and getting in sunlight well, than what we've already figured out yeah. and the amount of us that are stuck indoors now yep. and I, I i do think there's some validity though because uh courtney started to do her own vegetable garden outside and uh i told you guys about these carrots like we had these carrots that literally they almost like tasted like ginger they were so packed with like minerals yeah and it was just like whoo this is spicy like uh -huh. i've never had like a spicy carrot i was like this is weird uh -huh. but it's like it was, you know it was <laughs> like the like soil was like very uh uh rich that sounds like a cute pet name you'd give your spouse you yeah. spicy carrot spicy get carrot. over here you little spicy carrot <laughs> That's Jessica. She has the weirdest. <laughs> here she calls she calls Aurelius. That's my nickname. Uh, uh, little pickle or little something pickle. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you little pickle. I'm like what? 
Why would you call him a pickle? <laughs> I don't know. It's cute. Anyway, I got to call out. I got to make a call out right now. I got to call out our YouTube producer, Andrew, because handsome. this call guy. Call him out. I, yesterday, I, get, I go out in the parking lot, oh. and somebody's fucking- Did he mess with you? Calling my name out. Yeah. And I'm like- and it's coming from a speaker somewhere. I'm like, what? It's like, Sal Stefano. So I'm like, what the fuck yeah. is going on? Mind pump, Justin. Yeah. 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 I, like, I get in the car because I can't figure out what's from. I'm just going to get in the car and leave. I drive yeah. off. And then one of you guys says he just got himself a new car that lets him do that. Yeah. I'm like, you fucker. The new yeah. Tesla makes the you Tesla. Can speak out. You can speak through it. I didn't know that. Yeah, dude. I didn't yeah. know yeah. he could do that. So he's yeah. been fucking with us. Yeah. And it like time. distorts the voice a little. So it's like kind of low and <laughs> yeah, old. And I'm like, dude, this is creepy. And so, so I, I kept looking to see who's saying it. And there's a guy like in a truck parked there. <laughs> and I started looking at him. I'm like, what's up? Like, like Wait, you know, I'm a fan. I'm like, hey, man. And he's just like looking at me like, what? Yeah, dude. There was a guy having <laughs> coffee. Like Thanks, there was Andrew. a guy having coffee. I thought it was him. And I was like waving at him and everything. And, like, and he's like looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. like, I'm just going to get in my car because yeah, I don't know yeah, where this like, is okay, coming from. Okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> it's like, is it God? Hey, yeah. what's up? So I, I wanted to add, I want to add something to, uh, to our, our qua that I think would be kind of cool. And it, I would like us to be consistent with it in every episode. I believe that we've been doing this long enough that we can do this where, uh, one of us recommends a follow. So somebody that one of us follows that you know puts out content. And I like it does, it. I, I obviously uh, fitness is our wheelhouse. So of course we'll probably recommend a lot of health and fitness people that we think are promoting good mm. information or good message. But that we we you know promote somebody, talk about what, why we follow them or why we like them. But at every episode that the listeners will get some sort of a recommendation of someone who we like, and it doesn't have to necessarily be in there. So we can go uh, in any direction. But I think we could commit to that. You think yeah, we, we could yeah, do that? Absolutely. I want to. St I'll start with uh, the guy recently who I just shared it in my story because I've just found him and he, and I like the idea of um, promoting somebody who I see is like up and coming that probably a lot of people don't know who he is. I think he only had like twenty thousand followers, maybe sub seventeen. I think even yeah. fifteen or fifteen or seventeen thousand followers, and it, he got our attention because he redid a um, a TikTok video. Of this kid that that kind of was trying to clown on Sal because I said deadlifts are good for the back and he's like, dude, no, it's not. so funny. Biomechanically, blah 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 blah. And it does build a lot of muscle. Okay, you ask anybody who's been not really, very yes, really, big work. He, he big did work. exactly what I was like when I saw that video initially. I was like, oh, somebody needs to counter his counter, yeah. and then he did it. He did. Like, oh, he brilliant. did. And and you know, and of and course, his information is good. I went. Through yeah, so I went through his stuff first. I wouldn't have. Uh, I wouldn't recommend him just because he he rebuttaled Sal getting clowned on. But then I went through his content. And uh, his his programming, I see the stuff that the way he he recommends to like a beginner lifter and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I see the way he communicates. It's legit, so, yeah, very legit. I think he he and you could tell he's intelligent, and you could tell that he communicates it in a very practical, reasonable way. And I love I love people like this, and I and I especially get annoyed by like the kid who he was countering, where these kids like to 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 take you know sound or clips from their textbook that they just learned, and they try and like you know, make a huge argument around something that is so specific, but there's so much more nuance to the point that, you know, like Sal was trying to make in that video. And so uh, his, his Instagram handle, I believe he's on TikTok too, but his, his Instagram handle that I found was uh, look like you lift. So it's all yeah, good all, information. Yeah. Yeah. So shout out to him. Um, my commitment to the audience is that uh, one of us three will bring somebody who we've either recently found or that we've listened to for a long time, or we really like yep. uh, to add a little bit of value to, yeah. to the qual. Check this out. Did you know you may not be absorbing all the nutrients that you take in? Did you know that if you have digestive issues that that could really hamper your fitness progress? Well, there's a company called Masszymes that makes digestive enzymes for athletes Digestive enzymes, the good ones, break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates to help you assimilate those nutrients, get those nutrients to the target tissues, so you build more muscle, burn more body fat, become healthier, uh, and reduce gastrointestinal issues like bloating, constipation, and diarrhea. Check this company out. Go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash mind pump. Then use the code mindpump10 for 10% off any order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First caller is Kara from Iowa. Hey, Kara. How can we help you? Hi. How are you guys doing today? We're doing good. good. That's awesome. So, um, obviously, I have to say thank you. You guys are awesome for everything you do. Um, you've taught me way more than any of my certifications have. So, thank you for that. Um, hop into my question then. So, 
my main question is how can I lose body fat after kind of like a failed bulk? I consider it. I don't know if I need to do more of an aggressive cut or if I need to like up my activity or something. Um, so I'm kind of confused on where to go. I've been working out for a little bit here. You see super low calories about three years ago, slowly started weight training, slowly increased my calories to about 1400 for a little bit. And then at the beginning of the year here, I went on an actual bulk where I increased my calories to 2200, um, started running anabolic that worked pretty well, but then tried to cut, didn't see a lot of progress there. Ran hit, didn't see a whole lot of progress there. And now I'm in the end of symmetry and not sure what I should do after symmetry to lose a little bit of body fat there. Okay. How long were you at low calories before you did the bulk? Um, like in the beginning? Just like how long in general? Like you said that was your first bulk. I'm assuming before that you were almost always kind of in a low calorie state. Is that true? Yeah, pretty much. Always, usually around 900 to the max I went to that was like 1400 okay. calories. It's going to take some time. You're going to have to, okay. you're going to have to live in the 2200 calorie space while continuing to focus on strength for a while, okay. uh, because your body's a little resistant, right? So when you drop your calories, it adapts right away and you didn't, you're, you're not seeing any, any weight loss or any fat loss. So, I mean, two options are to cut it even more, which is going to put you back to where you were before, um, kind of in this crappy place, or we got to keep, basically tell your body it's okay to burn more calories that when you cut your calories, it's okay to burn body fat. That's going to take a while. So you might need to stay in that 2200 calorie range or even higher for like a year and just focus on strength, just focus on body sculpting, just kind of stay in that space of strength for a while before attempting a cut again. I, I want to know a little bit more about, uh, the, uh, it, being a failed bulk, like what do you mean by it's, it was a failed bulk? What what, what what leads you to believe you failed? Yeah, so I knew you guys were going to ask this. So I had a good reasoning or a kind of good reasoning. Um, I feel like it failed because I felt like I gained some muscle, but it wasn't a lot. I felt like I gained more fat than muscle. The main goal of the bulk was to grow my glutes, which did happen. My glutes did grow, um, but it feels like I added so much like body fat to my stomach region, especially, which... I know being female, female, that's kind of where it goes to, but that's where I see that it failed is it was more fat than muscle in my opinion. Okay. So that this is an, an example of where I would, I would want you to go get measured so we could actually sit down and actually, cause a lot of times uh, we are extremely critical of ourselves and uh, a little bit of water tension or bloat we might feel is, oh, I'm getting fat or I'm putting on this bad weight. Um, but because you said you saw strength go up, you saw your glutes did build, which is was the focus. So definitely we, we were moving in the right direction. Now, it, there is a possibility you added a little bit too many calories too fast or maybe your activity level didn't increase yeah. at all or you might have reduced it and so there is a possibility i'm not saying that you're wrong that you didn't put more body fat on than muscle that's pos but i would want that data like i would tell you like okay uh, back to sal's advice let's stick to this a little bit longer let's go get your body fat tested right now and then let's test your body fat in let's say a month or two following the calories that i want following the programming i want and then together we could sit down and go like okay you, you, you added seven pounds to the scale, how much of that was fat, how much of that was muscle, and to determine on are we doing are we going at this too fast or not because some of what you might be experiencing might be more psychological than yeah. it is actual. Did you do any circumference measurements in terms of like overall? So I did not. I had originally, so I had worked at a gym last year when I was around 1,400 calories, and I did body fat testing there. I was about like 50. But I was pretty low for a female. So like you could kind of see my abs. Like I looked pretty ripped, which I loved, but I knew for my health, I needed to go up in body fat a little bit. So I'm wondering if it is more like psychological, but I didn't do any specific body measurements, which I can start doing that now. I want to get some calipers to actually do my body fat at home mm -hmm. since I don't have like the in-body scans anymore. Um, but yeah. 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 So you went, you were at 15%. You don't know where you're at now. How much weight did you gain on the scale? About 10 pounds. I oh. was about 115 when I started. I'm roughly 125. And she got stronger? Now. Yeah, and you got yeah. stronger. You're fine. How tall are you? I am five foot three. Oh, you're good. 
You're good. I, you okay. probably, yeah. Even if you gain some body fat, what, you, what, you, what did you go up to? Twenty percent? Uh, no way. I don't even think you went up twenty percent. I mean, I can't see all of you, but I can see some of you. you look pretty lean, just off your arms and shoulders. So I, I wouldn't worry too much. I, I'd say I'd stay in that in that you know slightly higher in that higher calorie range for a while, and just focus okay. on building strength and stuff like that. And you don't you don't want to obsess too much with staying in the in the mid teens of body fat as a woman. That's still to live there is is kind of low. You, you want to be in the high teens, low twenties most of the time. It's okay, okay to go down to fifteen here and there, but you don't want to live there. You know, you don't want to live at fifteen percent. For for most women, that's just a little a little too lean. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sensing it. This is it's more psychological for you. You're probably used totally. to, used to being very lean and eating low calorie, and now you're eating more calories than you ever have. Totally. You might have put on a little bit of body fat percentage, but here's the thing: you go from eating fourteen hundred calories to eating twenty two to twenty three hundred calories. You're talking about five to seven hundred more calories a day. Uh, you're going to have more carbohydrates in you naturally from that. You're going to have more water retention naturally because of that. So, and then, then also potentially now that you've increased calories, there could be also foods that uh, are messing with you a little bit that are causing a little bit more bloat and water retention too. So that is something that I would, uh, while we're coaching, I'm coaching you through this. I'd also be kind of paying attention to how certain foods are making you feel. And that maybe when you eat certain things, you get that feeling of, Oh, I just feel like I, I feel fat or I feel like I put on this yeah. weight. Like, so I'd be, I'd be also asking questions around that, but I how, think, I think you're doing fine. How often are you lifting weights? Uh, so right now we're running symmetry and we're in the last part of symmetry. So um, doing the weightlifting, like the five by five for the three days and then the smaller sessions in between. So it was like three times a week just because we got full time jobs and it's crazy now. So we're wanting to try to go every day for like 30 minutes. So kind of follow what symmetry has laid out for the last um, phase, but tweak it a little bit after we're done. Um, okay. I feel like decreased after doing symmetry though, which probably makes sense. Cause I haven't like actually squatted for like two months at this point, but what was your, when you said your strength went up, when you went on your bulk, give me some ideas of where your, let's say your squat went up or your deadlift went up. What were the differences in weight? So my deadlift had went off, had went up a decent amount. I was at, I think like 135 to 140 for my deadlift for about four to five reps roughly. And it's gone up where I can probably do like 165 <laughs> to 170 really good about it I, my squat kind of just plateaued though like we just started doing this um last part of symmetry yesterday and i was doing 135 and i was tanked after that like i'm sore today and i know i put it too hard yeah you got a few you got a couple more weeks yeah. of the five by five but when you went on the bulk did your squat change uh it didn't really feel like it changed much um but my form also wasn't great so i'm wondering if it was more my form that okay. decreased in Mm. increase well i mean i mean a 20 pound gain in your deadlift is is big yeah you gain 10 pounds you, you, you know i would see you i would i would get you up to 135 body weight at your where you were body fat percentage wise and how much you're working out i would i think 135 would be even a good body weight for you and be relatively lean and strong i would like i said i think you should live in the 22 to 2400 calorie range for the next year and just focus on getting stronger. And then after that, see where you're at and see if you want to do a cut. What probably will happen is towards the end of the year, as metabolism starts to really ramp up, as your body gets a little bit more comfortable with, you know, burning body fat, you may actually find yourself get leaner at the end of that year anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah. I so, think, I think that's where you need to be though. Okay. So I get married next August. So I kind of want to be lean at that point do you think at august would be a good point where i could cut or is that too soon i i think you could wait because of how lean you keep yourself already naturally i would actually i would keep you in like a bulk or you know a higher calorie until like june till like six weeks before the wedding yeah and then six weeks i would slowly bring you down yep. yeah yep uh, you because you are already pretty lean already i would keep the calories pretty high all the way until the final six weeks and if we've done a good job you've added a little bit of weight and you may even be able to add more calories in a perfect world I've got you up to 24, 25, 2,600 calories a day. And then you cut down to two. Yeah, and then I cut you down to 2,000 calories, and you lean out really nice, like heading into your wedding, and you're eating more than you've ever ate before. That's a, that's a perfect world for me. But part of that is overcoming the eating more than I've ever ate before and the psychological mind fuck of, oh God, I feel fat or oh God, I feel, but I, and when really you're not. And so getting some objective data, I think is something that will help you. So go get the body fat percentage. Um, and so long as you didn't jump up to 25% body fat, which I don't think you did, I think you're doing just fine. 
Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So All just right. keep bulking. You got stronger it. And Do we awesome. recommend the next Thank program? Yeah, well, I think, uh, um, I mean, maps, and anab- I would go maps anabolic and then, and then you could go maps aesthetic after that. Do you have anabolic? Uh, we do. I have it through somebody else, so I don't personally have it, um, but I do have access to it. Yes. Okay. You know that you're not supposed to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to send you anabolic so you don't get to steal it from yeah, somebody else. You have your own portal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you have your own. Do you, do you, do you take someone's Netflix too? <laughs> uh, we lost her, Doug. Yeah, we lost her, her sound. That's right. Yeah, the voice uh, went silent here. That's all right. Kara, listen, we're going to send you Maps Anabolics. You don't have to steal someone else's anymore. (laughs) And then after that, go for Maps Aesthetic, okay? Thank you. You got it. Thank you. Yeah, so um, (laughs) I thought she was honest about that. I wonder how many people do that. (laughs) You know, I I tell you, it's uh, if you've been in a cut for a long time and gotten your calories down, 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 and then you do like one bulk and expect yourself, your body to just react... When you cut back down, oftentimes you got to stay there for a while. Well, mm-hmm. I, th- to me, this is all, this is psychological. Totally. She's uh, 15. You could tell she's still lean. Um, used to being in, in phenomenal, uh, walking around with abs. Yeah. Okay? You're walking Since around you're with shredded, abs yeah. as, as, a, as a female, more rare than as a male even. So she's walking around with abs. She decides she's going to go on a bulk for a while. She's only been running it for a few months. Right. She goes up, you know, would you say 10 pounds on the scale? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, pounds. three to five of that is water. Water. Right out, water right out the gates. So, I mean, five pounds. And then as she got stronger. Yeah. So we know some muscle got built. So, I, I mean, maybe she put two pounds of fat on. Yeah. Which no, is fine. Nothing, which is, which yeah. she needed to. Yes. So, I mean, I think most of the time, more often. And then, but I do want to highlight how how even more challenging this could be. Like, let's say you wouldn't, because you start ending up eating more calories, you end up allowing sometimes more dip, more foods and more variety into your diet. And sometimes you allow food. I've had this happen before where a client, I'm, you know, I, I have them bulk and have them increase like with an avocado or something. And they actually have some sort of a reaction to an mm-hmm. avocado. And I have no idea. And they're telling me like, I feel so fat. I feel so bloated. And so with the incre- increase of calories, the increase of water and carbohydrates. Yeah. And the potential for inflammation goes up. That's right. Out. And then, yeah. and then a food and then, goes up and then a food that kind of disrupts them a little bit. That also makes them feel that you know feel even worse, and so then in their head they're like, "Oh my god, I'm getting fat," and it's like, "No, you're yeah. not. You're doing a great job. We just need to figure a few things out." Totally. Our next caller is Wade from Colorado. Wade, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, how are you? It's uh, it's great to be here. I appreciate everything you do and and taking the time with my question today. Awesome, thank All you. Right. I'll I think I'll just jump right in with the kind of broad question, then maybe get into the little details and personal items. Uh, so my main question is how dialed in does someone have to be to put on muscle at age 50? I'm, I just turned 49. I'm about six foot two bounce between 185, 190 pounds. I've been weight training pretty consistently for 10 years now, but aside from some noob gains, I've, I've never really put on much size. I tend to hover around 13 to 16% body fat. Uh, when I when I cut, I feel kind of scrawny, and when I try to put on weight, I kind of feel like it just goes to my belly. Um, so other issues I have, I guess, calorie wise, I'm trying to bump it up. I I kind of had the Justin problem of not eating breakfast for you know a decade or more. So I'm right now. I'm looking at my notes. The last couple of days, I tracked. 24, 2,500. Uh, I'm kind of missing my protein goal. So I know, I know I need to bump that up. My fat intake seems really high, which I was kind of surprised. Uh, yesterday, for example, hit 120 grams of fat, but only hundred grams of protein. So I, I know there's some things I need to dial in there, but other than that, what advice can, can you give me? And, and for someone my age, my goal being to put on muscle and then maintain it. W- Wade, you'd be a blast to train right now. Oh, yeah. yep. Because you know, there's like some, like real, honestly, you have just a couple subtle tweaks and I think we would just respond. You're also doing pretty good. Yeah. 6'2", 190. That's the other 13 thing. 13 to 16% body fat, you know. Um, what, what's what, what's less of a factor is not, is your age, your age is actually less of a factor here. What's more of a factor that I would consider 
with muscle gain, besides the stuff that we could change that we'll talk about, is the fact that you've been lifting for 10 years. So it's really hard for anybody to build muscle at any point, but especially after three to five years of training. After 10 years of training, it's really hard to gain additional muscle. Now, I noticed in your question, you mentioned our muscle potential calculator and how it would say that you have all this room to grow. What you need to understand is the muscle potential calculators use top level natural bodybuilders as the criteria. And very few people have those kinds of genetics. So it's basically telling you with all the perfect training and diet and sleep and amazing, crazy muscle building genetics, this is what you can reach. So most people aren't going to be able to, to get there. And I wouldn't necessarily use that um, as, as, as like a, a hard target. But look, first off, just getting your protein up to 150 to 200 grams of protein a day is going to make a huge difference. Huge difference. Mm -hmm. And can... And consistently every like, day it can't be a day or two and then you then and then you fall off for three or four days it's yep. really low you want to consistently be hitting that uh every single day and honestly um i'd be pushing you higher than that like that would be we'd fall back at the the 150 range i'd be pushing you up to 200 trying to get 200 it'd be the goal yeah uh, and then I know that some days you might file, fall a little short um and then uh what are you doing are you following one of the maps programs right now yeah, so I've I've run anabolic uh, twice uh, performance. I just started hit just to kind of change things up. I, I changed my training from evenings because it was inconsistent to mornings now. So doing the short workouts is kind of helpful there. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't like hit for you if you're trying to build. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. Know. yeah, yeah. That'll build stamina. That's not going to build uh, tons of muscle. I would go map strong or maps um, fifteen, but yeah, do the 15. do the advanced version where you're doing 20, 25 minutes every day. Um, that actually might be pretty good for you. But less is more. As you get older, less is more. So here's what happens as we age with uh, muscle building potential. And yes, you start to reduce the capacity to build muscle. But that doesn't really start to kick in until a little later. You're not really there yet. Now, what what ends up what people tend to point to is oh, reduce lowering you know, lowering testosterone levels. But what people don't realize is androgen receptor density tends to go up as we age. So, a forty nine a healthy forty nine year old may have you know lower free testosterone than a healthy twenty nine year old, but his androgen receptor density is going to be higher. So, as we age, if you're healthy and working out, you'll see the androgen receptor density go up. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about the age thing. Um, I would do really, really good workout programming. Less is more, especially after you've been working out for 10 years already and bump your protein. And you can take calories away from fat. You said your fat intake was really high. Um, if you don't want to gain body fat, I would do a calorie trade, cut the fat, you know, cut however many calories from fat and make up for it with protein. And you can do it with, you know, lean cuts of meat, or protein shakes, uh, but I, I think Whole Foods is going to be your, your best option. I think if you just mainly focus on hitting your protein, the rest will fall in suit. You'll probably gain, yeah. uh, honestly, if you if you got your protein up, even if you kept your calories the same, I would you probably gain like three, four pounds of lean body mass yeah, just yeah. from doing that. I, I literally think I would just have you focus on protein. I'd be like, that's go get that, and then I bet a lot of the other macros fall in. So long as you don't eat like an asshole, you don't just totally go off the rails and eat fast food or do some shit like that. Focus on hitting the protein intake. Make that a priority. And then I like MAPS 15 right now, and then move you into MAPS aesthetic after that. So mm -hmm. Matt, Doug is going to send MAPS 15 to you right now so you have access to the advanced to that. version do the that. advanced version of maps 15 the last thing that i that i would re recommend you do um even though you didn't say anything that would lead to this or complain just because you're you're coming up on 50 is to get your blood work done and just see where your hormones are yeah i don't know if you've done that uh, i haven't done blood work but i've done like the spit test and and stuff like that and i started working with dr cabral's team okay good oh uh, you're good so yeah so i think i'll be good there i'm not, Testosterone and hormone levels seem pretty good with the basic testing I've done, but good. I haven't done full yeah, uh, if you're with, if you're with Cabral, you're in good hands. That's all. I, I mean, that was the only thing that I would probably a add to the, what we talked. You about. look really healthy too. I'm going to be honest with you. Just seeing you on camera, you look like a really healthy 49 year old. So I think you're doing pretty good. Yeah, and your numbers are great. I mean, yeah. keep, keeping your honestly, what we're focusing on is uh, a desire, right? Let's add some muscle. Let's get a little more jacked. But technically. You're in a very healthy, good place. That body fat range for your age, for and the fact that you're strength training, I mean, you are in a really good place. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong with, hey, I want to put on, let's try and put on 10 or 15 pounds of muscle and just you, see you, what I look you like. You know what's realistic, I would say, for someone where you're at? I mean, I think you could gain 5 to 10 pounds of lean body mass, probably closer to 5, and bring your body fat percentage down a little bit, stay around 190, but you just, you're going to look different. 
You know, if you lost five pounds of fat and gained five pounds of muscle, it doesn't sound like a lot, but at your body weight and height, you, it would look pretty different. You'd have a, a really, you'd have a different looking physique. You'd, you'd definitely be able to tell. And that's a lot of muscle for somebody who's been working out for 10 years. I know it doesn't sound, I say five pounds doesn't sound like a lot, but to gain five pounds of lean body mass after working out for 10 years, that's a, that's a, that's a good amount of lean body mass. Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of committed to, you know, the, the slow and steady, I'm giving myself a good, you know, year or two to, to kind of work on this. I'm very goal oriented. I used to do a lot of obstacle course racing and I did some Muay Thai for a while and things like that. So when I have things that I'm training for, I'm a little more focused. So this is kind of my switch of mindset to try to train just to build some mass or, or chase strength or something like that. Yeah. The, the yep. protein intake alone is going to make a big difference. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's going to be a huge difference. That'll be like two, three pounds of lean body mass <laughs> right away. But the combination like, of switching programming, adding the, uh, adding the protein intake up uh, consistently, I think right away, you're going to start to see. Yeah. Do you the, supplement? Like, do you take creatine? Uh, I do that, just creatine and uh, krill oil right now is the only thing I take. Good. Well, you're on, you're on point then. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So stay the course up the protein, trade, Trade some bad calories for some better calories. Yep. And, and and follow a different program. HIT is not the one that you need to follow for yeah. what your goals Mass are. 15 advanced. We're sending that over to you. And then stay in touch with us, Wade. Reach back out in a, in a month or two and let us know how things are going. Awesome. I appreciate you guys. You got it. All right, Wade. Thanks. Oh, wait. I got I oh. got a quick follow-up. I almost forgot. Oh, sure. Uh, I wanted to ask Doug how his, how his training has changed uh, since he's the oldest of you guys. Yeah. Yeah, I pretty much follow uh, MAPS programs to the T. I've done anabolic probably close to 20 times. Mm. I've done aesthetic, strong. Uh, those are some of my favorite programs. Uh, Symmetry is one of the ones I just finished up most recently. But now I've cut back my training a little bit and doing the daily, uh, the MAPS 15 minutes advanced type workouts. So I've really enjoyed that. And then as far as the protein is concerned, um, yeah, for me, I, I was tracking my you know, macros. And I was discovering, I also was very low on my protein, uh, high on the fats. And so I've been really focusing on hitting the protein targets. So what have you done, Doug, to do that? Like, do you do a different breakfast now because of that? Or do you add something in the day that has allowed you to stay consistent with that? Yeah. So anytime I'm eating, I'm concentrating on, okay, making sure it's high in protein. And oftentimes I'm looking for, what is it like 10 grams per every hundred calories or 150 calories I'm eating. Um, and again, that's just cutting out carbs. That's actually reducing fat uh, and focusing on eating lots of, you know, meats and high protein um, foods. I mean, I love the creatures of habit for breakfast. I was doing two eggs every morning for breakfast, but the uh, creatures of habit has been great for me because that's 30 grams of protein right there with only 350 calories. So I'm re right in that target. Range. Yeah. So. Someone like, okay. Someone like Wade, who has been skipping breakfast for a very long time. I love the creatures of habit as like a, to insert that. Cause it's an easy, it's easy to, to suck that down. Cause it's not, doesn't feel like it's, he's also, he also weighs heavy more than Doug. So Doug's probably aiming for what? 150 grams of protein a day. Uh, at, yeah, probably at, at most. Yeah. yeah. So Wade, like e easy breakdown, you know, 200 grams of protein. I would go 50 grams of protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then add a 25 gram shake in between. And then you got your 200 right there. Yeah. Okay. I've done that as well as add some protein powders throughout today. Yep. yep. It makes a I difference. It. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I do do the uh, creatures of habit. I just started doing that oh, to, to help with breakfast and, and that seems to help a lot. So. Oh, good. Good, yeah. Good. If you hit 50 grams of protein with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there's 150, 25 grams in between protein shake as a snack. There's your 200 grams right there. Okay. Excellent. All right. All right Wade. Thanks for calling in, man. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. You All got right. it. Yeah, you know, um, age plays a role, but we place too much importance on age in terms of preventing us from getting, you know, any fitness goals or whatever. And in my experience, I've trained a lot of people and I've trained a lot of people in advanced age and I haven't seen age start to play a role Bro, the only until people start to get to their 60s. The right? only reason why a it's it's less about age, it's more about the years yeah. in a row of not doing something. Sure. Hardwired patterns. That yes. Established. That's now, age it, plays that's, a role as you get older and older and older, but it takes a while. It, yeah. I mean, look at Doug. Doug's been working out for a while. Yeah, that, that's His my, workout intensity is like it was when, I, for, when he first hired me. That's my point. My point is it's less to do with the number, their age. Yeah. It's more to do with the amount of years in a row of bad yeah. eating or bad bad workout or, or lack of nutrients that and the and what happens over years and years and year and decades of not hitting your nutrient intake of not if not hitting your protein on a regular basis of not strength training and then oh yeah when you're 50 and you didn't do a lot of things all these things become exponentially more yeah. difficult if you're like Doug and you've been consistently lifting for the last 20 years then like 
he's got a, a, a lifting age of 25 still. Yeah. So. No, it's funny. It's uh, when you when you uh, research athletes, um, what the what you lose as you age first is agility and then speed. Strength takes a while. Even boxers yeah. will tell you strength and power that old boxers will hit you just as hard as they did when they were younger. They just have the same agility and reaction type of stuff. That's that's what you start to lose. But it takes a while. It takes a while for age to really make a huge impact. Even Jack LaLanne. Jack LaLanne, I mean, of course, he was a phenom. But Jack LaLanne set records, the world records that stood for decades in push-ups and pull-ups in his mid-50s. Mm -hmm. In his mid fifties, he set those, and he didn't say that he had to modify his workouts till he got into his late sixties. Um, and and but again, compared to his peers, he was light years ahead, right? So the whole age thing that that really starts to make a huge difference much later. Our next caller is Ty from Illinois. Ty, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, what's up, boys? Thanks for choosing my question. Yeah, um, <laughs> so basically, a little background information on me. Um, I'm 22. Uh, I'm actually a new personal trainer um, in this year. Basically, I've focused for myself mostly on like developing some calisthenic skills um, and doing more hypertrophy training. But in the past couple months, when I discovered you guys, I heard you guys talk about like the five by five kind of stuff a lot and like lower rep training. And I've been kind of curious to implement that with myself and also with clients. I think it'd be you know, just beneficial for me to have that experience, the firsthand experience when I give that to them. But I still want to keep up with my skills in terms of like learning to planche and handstand and all that stuff. And I was just kind of wondering what the best modality you guys could give me to like, I guess, help work on both a little bit, like my max strength and also the skills basically. What do you guys think about him doing something like MAPS anabolic and then on his trigger days, he does like his calisthenic work? Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that that would work, that would work. but you got to you got to keep the calisthenic work as practice, unless it's yeah. a workout. Look, something's going to give is 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 the bottom line. Like you can't master both at the same time, so it's uh, going to be a bit of a balance. So you have to you have to ask yourself what's more important. If it's the strength, then you're going to spend more time in the strength training. If it's the calisthenics, then you're going to spend more time in the calisthenics. So that's that's really going to be the breakdown. I mean, if you want to do an even balance, you could do you know two days a week of calisthenics, two days a week of strength training. And kind of keep it, keep it like that. Um, but yeah. it's it's going to be a balance. You can't have, you know, everything, right? So you do a lot of one, it's going to take away from the other one. Yeah, because the issue I was kind of running into was, I would start like basically, like I said, the five by five training. I would start like doing basically like a five one arm push ups, like five by five, or like a bench press, and I was still trying to work on the other in the same workout. You know what I mean? Or like. I would do the other, but in a more bodybuilding style, like hypertrophy, like 10, 12, 15 reps, you know? And it just didn't feel like it was the best I could be doing. It was too much. And that, yeah. It was yeah. too much. Here, you know, here's something. Like, like you could do your normal calisthenic workout and do one compound lift. Just do one five by five, right. and that's it. You, you, if, you okay. over, if you do too much of, of the strength training with the barbells and dumbbells, you're going you're gonna to overtrain. So if you like the calisthenics, you want to keep it, but you want to build some strength... Literally, you know, you could, you, when you do your calisthenic workout at the end, add one compound lift. So one day you okay. might do a deadlift, another day you might do a squat, another day you might do an overhead press. Okay, I get you. Yeah. And pretty much just keep the calisthenics workout like the same? Uh, I, yeah, but I would reduce it a little bit because you're adding volume from the, for the strength training. Yeah. If you want something structured, okay. MAPS Anabolic would be good. Yeah. And you could do one or two of the foundational workouts a week and then one or two of your normal calisthenic, calisthenic workouts, but do them on different days. Are you okay. willing to yeah, cycle that, that specifically? Like just, just go through a few weeks of just running a program and then coming back to calisthenics in terms of like – Using calisthenics as a skill, like Adam was kind of suggesting with uh, trigger days, but like very low impact with that. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, really focusing a lot more on the five by five style training to, you know, acquire that, that as its own specific skill. Yeah. Okay. I guess you. Yeah. Just, you yeah, know, I mean, just the biggest season. Reason, the biggest reason I was like, trying to experiment with that is because I hear you guys always talking about how like the granite look it kind of gives your muscles mm -hmm. versus like the bubbly versus like you know tr traditional hypertrophy um and also like the gym that I'm work for like just opened and it's kind of like a dungeon you know <laughs> awesome. so like a lot of the events and stuff is all like freaking like 
like maxing out on like squats or deadlifts or like, well, not maxing out, but like just lifting a lot. And that's not something I'm super used to. So I kind of want to get better to that so I can fit into that. Look, Ty, if, if fitness is your career and your passion, there's nothing wrong with training just, you know, straight three months for strength training. That's exactly yeah, what, that's what I was going to say to you is that, going. bro, you're, if you're going to get into training clients and stuff like that, you're going to want to, you're going to want to move out of just focusing on calisthenics. Like they, they have yeah. tremendous benefits and value and you're going to be able to bring uh -huh. that to your clients, which is going to mm -hmm. be awesome. But there's so much you're missing out on by not running a strength cycle completely. I would love to see you run anabolic as it's laid out for an entire three months. Okay. And, you know, doesn't mean that you can't do a little bit of your calisthenics so you don't feel like you lose it. But I would do it on my off days. I wouldn't do it crazy intense. Uh -huh. I wouldn't want it hour long. I would I would pop up and do some of my handstand work, some of your balance and stability stuff that you're messing around with. Or maybe trade out an exercise instead of overhead press, do handstand push-ups. Yeah, like that. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's ways for you to still kind of mold – the anabolic like format with some of your calisthenics in, in intertwined, but really try and run a really strength based program for three months because I think one, your body's gonna get tremendous value from it. And then even more importantly, what you're gonna learn from that that you're gonna be able to communicate then to your 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 clients is gonna be uh the value of that is just you can't you can't measure that. Yeah. It's gonna be way, way better than yeah. just trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, work your calisthenics into a run, run the anabolic cycle. Yeah, let's do that. Go, go maps anabolic. After that, you could do something like strong or performance, uh -huh. which I think you would enjoy, but there's nothing wrong with training specifically in a particular style of training for three months and then moving to something else, especially if this is your career and you enjoy doing this. Yep. Yeah, of course. Last, awesome. last suggestion for you, Ty, if you have not gone and watched the free webinar that Justin and I both did on the maps prime and prime pro, you need to do that. Yeah, I have not. Is it on the website or it's, on it's YouTube? MapsPrimeProWebinar.com or MapsPrimeWebinar.com. Yeah, it's it's PrimeProWebinar.com. Oh, okay, so PrimeProWebinar.com. There you go. Yeah, go to PrimeProWebinar.com and it's a free webinar. Watch that. It's, it's It was designed for coaches and trainers to help you guys out. Okay, awesome. Yeah, cool. well, I appreciate that, guys. Yep. You got it, cool, man. man. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, thanks. You have a good one. You got it. Well, that, there's that question again, right? I want to do everything. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I get it too. Like we can kind of work that out and like create some kind of hybrid. But if you're really trying to understand all the nuances of those type of lifts and especially in a five by yes. five style, it, it requires it. a lot more focus. So why not devote yourself a little bit more exclusively to that? Well, not in why I, lo I love that everybody was on the same page and you went that way is because dude, it's not like after three months, you can't go back to calisthenics. Yes. And you're not gonna like you're not gonna lose walking on your hands. You're not. No, gonna and he's a trainer. Like, how much no. value is he gonna get from learning? All yeah, this you're stuff? not gonna lose all those skills in three months' time. If anything, you're just gonna get bigger, stronger, more muscular. Now, they might diminish a little bit with a hard focus just on anabolic and not of doing any calisthenics. But you'll gain it back. But you'll gain it right back. Yeah. And 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 what you'll have learned and gained from the three months of transitioning out of it is just. I mean, this is no different than. Uh, the power lifter who always lifts like a power lifter and doesn't want to train like a bodybuilder, the bodybuilder who doesn't want to do that like power lifter, the mobility guy who never trains like a power. I mean, we get in these camps of a, a training modality that we love. And then even though you hear the message from mind pump, you're like, okay, how do I still yeah. stay in my camp? But I, I'll, I'll dabble a little bit in the other things that these guys talk yeah. about that it's so beneficial. It's like, that's probably, you need to get out of the camp for a little bit and go, go try a different modality. Next caller is David uh, from the UK. David, what's happening? How can we help you? Um, good, thanks. Uh, first of all, like everyone else, I want to say it's great to be here and the, the things that you put out there have been really useful for me, at least over the last few years. So Excellent. I want to say thank you for that. Awesome. Great. How can we help um, you? So uh, my question is, how much uh, should I look to drop weight when I'm training for a marathon or an Ironman? So I get some background. I'm, I'm, I'm 30. I'm about 170 pounds and over the last 18 months i've progressed from kind of no triathlon experience to completing uh, an ironman in july um i've got a marathon up in september and another ironman next uh sorry in april and an ironman in september but i i really enjoy going to the gym i enjoy lifting weights um and i know in the past you've said you know when you do two different types of of exercise you know you, you're never going to be great in, in either one and I'm, I'm fine with that right i'm never going to break the tape at Kona and I'm never going to be in a weightlifting meet. So that's fine. Um, but as my training progresses for the endurance stuff, 
I'm really struggling to do even kind of relatively light weights for me in the gym. So I just kind of really wanted to know what your recommendations would be for how far to drop down the weight and how to maybe progress whilst doing endurance or whether to bother with progression at all and just keep it light. Yeah, a good question. So the challenge, so is this for a marathon or another Ironman? Uh, it'll be a marathon in April and then immediately after I'm starting training for an Ironman, which will be in September. Now, just for reference, like the, the amount of volume and training that someone does to get ready for, especially an Ironman is immense. I've, I've trained two Ironman competitors and I was blown away by the amount of running, swimming and cycling. And just, it was just insane. It's just a lot of mileage. It's a lot of work. It's hours and hours a week. And to, to expect your, you to maintain strength or even build strength throughout that process is really asking your body for something that's almost impossible. So you want to, you want to gauge your performance in your chosen sport and you want to strength train to support that or to prevent injury. That's about it. So I wouldn't even worry about the weight on the bar. It's about, you should feel better from your strength training. So whatever you're doing in your strength training, if it feels like it's burning you out or you're getting too sore, then drop it down even more. I got to the point where I was training Ironman competitors and we were doing 35 to 45 minutes of strength training once a week. Mm -hmm. And the intensity was moderate at most. It was moderate. Anything more than that, and they just... It's just supportive at It was that too point. much. Yep. Yeah, really just helping out to bring in stability to your joints and making sure everything's like working and connecting properly so yeah less way way less than you probably imagine now my recommendation for this is different today than probably would have been just actually a year or two ago and and that's based off of the, a great conversation that we just had with Corey schlesinger did you listen to that episode by chance with the the nba sports performance coach we did i haven't yet no you should listen to that episode um because I think what I would, so in the past, I would say like, oh, we would strength train once a week. That's it. One full body routine uh, a week for an hour would be kind of the protocol. Then the rest is dedicated towards your Ironman training, where now I would actually probably take that one hour workout and I would actually would probably break it up over the course yeah, of the entire week, the week with and, and do it as the way he does it, which is what he calls micro dosing your training. So I would take what would normally be done, let's say like a MAPS anabolic routine, so a full body workout, but I'd actually split that up over five to seven days in the week. So basically you're doing like one exercise, maybe two in a day, and it's not a lot of volume whatsoever, and it's not a lot of crazy intensity. It's literally to Sal's point and Justin's point to support your, your, your sport. And that would be my gauge on if I'm actually applying the right amount of intensity and volume is, you know, week by week, you're getting back to me like, I'm feeling great, Adam. I feel strong. I also, I feel like I'm, I'm hitting my times and I feel good afterwards. Like to me, I know that I'm hitting you just right. And then if you're not, you're like, oh my God, I still feel sore when I do my run from our workouts. Like, okay, I need to back off the intensity. And so yeah, that's you know what that I would look you. like, I think would be like, uh, like three sets of a compound lift five days a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like five days a week, pick one pick compound one. lift, yeah, do three sets. That's it. And two days off. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that does. And would you do that at close to the weight that you normally do it, or would you still be pulling that back even it, if you're kind of I micro dosing? I wouldn't pay attention to the weight, but rather pay attention to the feel. It should feel like moderate intensity and good form and smooth. You're not trying to beat yourself up. So think of it this way you're going to the gym to practice a compound lift for three sets. So think of it like that. Don't think I'm going to work out, I'm going in there to practice. This compound lift. I, th I think you could push yourself weight wise, even though you don't need to focus on that. But you, but you don't ever want to come to failure. Like so, every every set you've got two more in the tank. I mean, so so whatever weight on the bar that is for you, um, I I would try and I still would want to try and push you to get stronger a little bit. Uh, I think that just having that mindset because you're only doing three sets of a compound lift. We're not really crushing it hard. But I never want to put so much weight on the bar and that I told you we're going to get five reps right here and you struggled to get five. Yeah, but like, consider this. like, j Just give us an example. When you're training for an Ironman, what does your, how many miles a week are you running, swimming, and cycling? Uh, so I, I guess a typical week looks about around two hours of swimming, um, about four or five hours of, of running, and then about seven hours of, of cycling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you really like, I would keep the intensity moderate. I, I swear to God, I took me, I trained, like I said, I trained two, two guys doing, they were great athletes. They're really good. They actually qualified for 
some pretty good events. And it was like anything over moderate intensity, just it's well, it because it it's the, so much. The easy goal is to, to to lean on what Sal's saying, which is go really easy and light, too easy and light. And then if you are feeling better, a little bit more, yeah. a little bit more, and just slowly increase it until you start to That's see what you'll see here. until you see adverse effects happen to your performance. Should energize you a bit, feel like it's benefiting you, not like taking away from your performance. Yep. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. No problem, David. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Do you have Maps Prime and Prime Pro? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, those would benefit you tremendously, just from the for correctional exercise perspective. Because one of the biggest challenges with training as much as you do is is injury prevention. So I'm gonna send you Maps Prime, and then if you wanted to do something additional to that, that would be Prime Pro. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, guys. You got it. No problem. That. Yeah, the the, vo the volume of training. Is so. I mean, did you see how many hours Dude, that was? Seven yeah. hours of that cycling. Was two, seven, after well, 13, four, 14. That's two hours a day, every day. Every day. Yeah, of intense. Of intense endurance type yeah. of training. Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's ridiculous. Well, that's, yeah. why, that's why I wanted to bring up the Corey Schlesinger yeah. episode because in the past, if I had this, because I had athletes like this, not a lot, but I had a few that I trained. And what it ended up happening was obviously early years, I made a lot of mistakes of trying to add like a normal training yeah, routine, so like a dumbass. Yeah. But then it then it turned out to be like you said, an hour of training and sometimes ended up having to reduce down to like 35 minutes. Now, after listening to Corey and how he works with these professional yeah, athletes like yep. in season, I would go, oh, this is how I would do it now. I would yeah. pick one yeah. exercise uh -huh. and I would do these, these micro dose. changed a lot of my thoughts around it. Oh, too. totally. No, I, I, use, I literally would get them. They'd come in and we would do 10 minutes of mobility. We do 35 minutes of, of strength training, which usually look like two exercises two, maybe three. And then at the end we would do more mobility and, and maybe stretching and they were done. Mm -hmm. And that was their workout. And I kept it moderate. And then we saw performance improvements, but when I did more than that, we, it would become detrimental. So it's, you know, it's one of those things. Look, if you like mind pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free giveaways. We have free guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam, and you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.